Hello students, we're going to be talking about chapter 15 today, um, basically transcription and translation, uh, talking about DNA to uh, protein transactions. Okay. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about how we discovered, how they discovered the um, translation or transcription translation cycles. So two key pieces of research were supported that um, genes code for the sequence of amino acids into proteins. So first was Sir Archibald Garrod. He studied the metabolic disease alcaptonuria. Um, alcaptonuria is a genetic disorder that has to do with um, like acid, in the body, it's uh, basically a urine type disease, urinary disease. Um, it turns your urine a darkish brown color. So um, being that it's genetic, it it's actually produces a wrong type of protein in your body. So he was studying how alcaptonuria affects, how the uh, genetic trait affects that in your body. So how it affects the proteins in your body. So he concluded that alcaptonuria is inherited through your body or through your ancestors. All right, um, Beto and Tatum, they hypothesize that uh, each oxotrophic strain had a defect in the gene that codes for the enzyme needed to synthesize one particular enzyme, so one particular amino acid, right? So, so they used a mutant form of this on, uh, on auger, probably. <clears throat> And what they did was they used mutant types, right? So they used ARG4, ARG2, and ARG1 mutants. So whatever was ARG4 didn't produce um, enzyme 1, let's say, or ARG2 didn't produce enzyme 2, right? And so ARG1 grows on MM argine, right? But not on citrulline or orthine, right? Because it will only allow for certain enzymes to be produced. So enzymes will only be produced if certain genes are present. That's the one gene, one, hy one enzyme hypothesis, or later produced one gene, one polypeptide hypothesis. Okay, so 1956, Francis Crick gave the central dogma um, name of this pathway, okay? Central dogma meaning you go from DNA to RNA to protein. Okay, you have your DNA, which is the list of all the um, instructions in your cells, right? And then that DNA is transcribed into RNA. And then that RNA is translated into protein. Excuse me. All right. And off to the side here, you can see that process. You have DNA goes through RNA polymerase into RNA and then goes through ribosomes into protein.
Okay. We have the genetic code, right? All of our systems have a genetic code. Nucleotide information that specifies an amino acid of a polypeptide is called the genetic code. So, all of our systems, we have the codons, right? Three, a three letter triplet of a code is called a codon. Okay, and that's how things are read inside the amino acids. Okay, in codons, you have three by threes. That's how things are read. Codon, codon, codon. Okay, keep in mind of that later. It's all by three, so you have three, three, and three. The code for the 20 different amino acids. We have 20 different amino acids, right, in the um, mature RNA. That's what that M stands for, is mature RNA. And you have A, U, G, and C. Now, A, T, G, and C, right? That thymine is replaced by uracil now. So A, U, G, and C are used in combination of three, right, for those codons. So here we have all the different types of amino acids and there's 64 different codon types. So of those 64 codons, 61 of them have specific amino acids for them. Or not specific amino acids, they specify amino acids. So of the 64 codons, 61 of them specify amino acids. One of them, AUG, is methionine. That's always the start codon. Methionine always starts the protein. Okay? Always starts the polypeptide chain. And then there's three of them, UAA, UAG and UGA that are stock codons. They don't specify amino acids, okay? But those are stock codons that will specify a terminal end. Those are stock codons, so that will specify the end of the protein that will specify the end of the polypeptide chain. So whenever you see those on the genetic code, that will end that chain. Okay. Features of the genetic code. So only two amino acids, methionine and tryptophan, are specified by a single codon, okay? All the rest of them have more than one codon. <clears throat> this is called degeneracy. Now, this could mean that some of them can switch back and forth between those types of codons. So you can have UCU or UCC or UCA or UCG, and they're all going to code serine, that SER. Okay, 
So, that third codon at the end there, it's really not that important. Unless you get to mutations. And we'll get into those a little bit later. Sometimes it is that important. And it can change the protein dramatically. All right, the genetic code is commonless. What does this mean? There's no indicators to mark the end of one codon and the beginning of the next. Right? There's no like real indicators in the line to say this is three, this is three, this is three, this is three. No, it's it's gonna keep going and keep going and keep going. Right? So if you looked at the list of codons, you would actually have to find the beginning where meth methionine is and find where the end is and try to find out this is three, this is three, this is three, this is three, this is three. And sometimes it doesn't even matter that way. Right, it's all jumbled up together. And that's where we're getting into introns and, exon and exon exons. We'll get into that a little bit later. The next one, genetic code is universal. All living organisms, including viruses, have this genetic code inside of them. Okay, they use the same type of uh, amino acids, they use the same type of proteins, everything like that. It just depends on where the amino acids go, where the proteins go, where the molecules come together. But there's an infinite number of possibilities. It just depends on where it binds. Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about transcription. So this the gene consists of two main parts. We're gonna have a promoter and a transcription unit. Okay, the promoter is the control sequence for the transcription. Okay, that's where it's going to start the transcription area. That's where it's gonna try, try to start transcribing. All right, transcription unit is, just, is the section of the gene that is copied into an RNA molecule. Right, that's that area. So the promoter is where it starts and the transcription unit is the whole area that it's transcribing. All right, transcription takes place in three different stages. We have initiation, elongation, and termination. Right, pretty simple. Where it starts, where it's going, and where it ends. Okay. First, we have initiation. Molecular machinery assembles the promoter and begins synthesizing the RNA copy of the gene. Right, we have the promoter region where it starts. First, we have transcription factors. These are special molecules, special proteins that bind to the promoter area, basically called a TATA box, T-A-T-A, -A -A. right? That's, uh, TA, those are specific um, nucleotides, right, part of the DNA. So 
So it'll bind to that area. The transcription factor will bind to that area where the promoter region is. And then RNA polymerase knows where to go, where that promoter, that transcription factor is. And it'll start catalyzing the assembly of the RNA nucleotides into the RNA strand. Right? Just a whole bunch of transcription factors go right there and it's like, hey, there's a whole crowd of them over here. RNA polymerase is like, oh, I can come over here now. All right. Elongation. So we have elongation. RNA polymerase moves along the gene, extending the RNA chain. So basically just unwinds it a little bit, unwinds the DNA a little bit, brings in some RNA molecules, brings them together, and then just knits a little RNA chain coming out the end. And then you have termination. Right at the end, you have what's called a cap. Okay, there's a little cap at the end and what's called a poly A tail. Okay, poly A is just um, adenine. RNA transcripts are RNA polymerase 2 and all RNA polymerase 2 are released from the DNA template. Okay. There's a little cap at the end. Um, the cap is phosphate. And then poly A tail is adenine. And then it'll bring the DNA back together and let the RNA go with the cap and that poly A tail. Now, it'll also go with another protein that brings it out into, um, through the nuclear membrane. All right, the difference is the, in transcription between eukaryotes and bacteria. So we have, in eukaryotes, RNA polymerase 2 can't bind directly to DNA. So they can't bind directly, they have to use transcription factors. In bacteria, RNA polymerase binds directly to the DNA. Um, so what I showed you before where the transcription factors were all around it, uh, in bacteria, RNA polymerase can just bind directly to it. In bacteria, specific DNA sequences or terminators can end transcription of the gene Eukaryotes, DNA has no equivalent sequences. So bacteria, they have terminators that just end the transcription. Um, eukaryotic DNA, they don't have those terminators. Uh, so what they have to do is, there's a special term for it. Um, I'm not really gonna get into it that much, but anyway, don't worry about it. Okay. So, specifically mRNA has to go through a type of production, okay? in order to be transformed into mature RNA, okay? What we just did was just produce RNA, okay? This is mRNA, this is mature RNA that has to go through the process, 
through the nuclear nuclear membrane and everything. Okay, mature RNA has to go through the membrane, has to go through um, translation and everything. All right. So mature RNA contains regions that code for proteins, along with non-coding regions that are important for protein synthesis. Uh, the coding region is flanked by untranslated regions. So we have a five prime untra untranslated region and a three prime untranslated region. And you can see off to the side that five prime and the three prime and then in the middle there that you have the coding sequence. A eukaryotic protein coding gene is transcribed into a precursor mRNA that must be processed in the nucleus to produce the translatable mRNA. Okay, so pre-mRNA is produced beforehand. So this is the pre-mRNA, pre-mRNA. So at the five prime end of the pre-mRNA, pre-mRNA, we have a five, five prime cap. Remember I was talking about that cap, right? Consisting of a guanine containing nucleotide, right? That five prime cap is a site where ribosomes attach the mRNA at the start of translation. Right? So it detaches right there, and then it starts translation. Proteins bind to a polyadenylation signal transcribed near the three prime end of the pre-mRNA and cleave at the pre-mRNA downstream of the sequence. So what does that mean? Basically, what you're doing is you're having all of this and cleaving all of those introns and exons out. Okay, it's going to try to cleave downstream of the sequence. Downstream. What do I mean by that? Five to three prime. Okay. So poly A polymerase adds a chain of 50 to 250 add nine nucleotides, a poly adenylation adenylation signal to the three prime end of the pre mRNA which protects it from digestion from like other proteins uh, non-protein so that's at the end non-protein sequences uh, in the pre mRNA are called introns and those coded for proteins are called exons, which are read continuously. mRNA splicing. Um, this occurs in the nucleus, right? This is where the introns are taken out, right? Um, it takes place in a spliceosome Right, that's where it's kind of folded, formed between pre-mRNA and several several small ribonucleoprotein particles, or SNRNP, or what's called SNRPs. Small nuclear RNAs bound to a number of other proteins. So what they do is they kind of fold them together and then just let them out. Spliceosome cleaves the pre-mRNA 
precisely to leave the intron and joins the flanking exons. And then there's alternative splicing. This is kind of a different process. If you have certain parts of your body that have certain needs and those parts only need certain parts of DNA but don't need other parts, they'll use what's called alternative splicing. So uh, many pre-RNAs are processed by reactions that join exons in different combinations. So they'll produce different mRNAs using a single gene. Um, in increases the number and different variety of uh, the proteins that are that are there, but you know they don't need as much space. So let's say that right here you have a smooth muscle, but you can change it to like a skeletal muscle just by switching up the DNA that's there. So alpha trip to myosin gene is alternatively, alternatively spliced in smooth muscle, skeletal muscles, fibroblast, liver, and brain. So you can change what the cell does depending on what exons you use. And then there's something called exon shuffling. Um, this is something that can allow for new genes to occur. This is something that allow for, for new genetic combinations to occur in nature. So combining new genes, combining um, novel genes to occur in through processes of natural selection um, mechanisms would produce changes much more quickly and efficiently than alternations in individual amino acids at some random points. Some of the ways that this can occur is through um, crossing over events, like through meiosis, this can occur. So exon shuffling can occur through that. Um, another way that this can occur is through just random mutations. I really can't think of any other way that this can occur, but if you can, that works for me. Okay. Now let's talk about translation. So this is through what's called transfer RNA. So tRNA. tRNA brings amino acids to the ribosomes uh, through to be joined uh, into polypeptide chains. So the tRNA brings the mRNA to the ribosomes in a sequence determined by the sequence of codons in the mRNAs. It's read from the five prime to the three prime end, as most things are. And the polypeptide is assembled from the N-terminal end to the C-terminal end. All right, so tRNAs kind of look like this little clover leaf helical uh, molecule. And it is actually made up of RNA. <clears throat> At one end is an anticodon. Right and it's bound to the mRNA at some point. The three, the three nucleotide loop that base pairs with the codon in the mRNA. At the other end is an amino acid corresponding 
to the anticodon. So at the other end, you have an amino acid in some form, right? Means it has some polarity in it. It also has that ester bond right on it. Okay. When it comes to the pairing of the tRNA to the RNA, there's what's called a Francis Crick wobble hypothesis. So pairing of the anticodon with the first two nucleotides of the codon is always precise, but the anticodon has more flexibility in pairing with the third nucleotide of the codon. Okay, what does that mean? So the third nucleotide, right, the third nucleotide is always flexible in pairing, right? So in many cases, the same tRNA anticodon can read the codons that either, that either have a U or a C in the third position. So sometimes it just has those two really solid, but if it has a U or a C in the third position, it'll just pick one. The special purine iocene allows even more extensive wobbling by allowing tRNA to pair with codons that have either U, C, or A in the third position. So it just decides sometimes. Sometimes those two first ones are so strong that the third one doesn't really matter. And that can cause some mutations to happen. I mean, this is biology. So not everything is going to be dead on perfect all the time. So anyways, next we have ribosomes, right? What's the thing that you, that goes through translation? It's going to be the ribosomes. So these are nucleotide protein particles, ribonucleotide protein particles that translate mRNA into chains of amino acids. Sorry. So they're either in the cytoplasm or attached to the ER. They're made up of two parts, right? The ribosomal subunit, one small ribosomal subunit, and then one large ribosomal subunit. Each composed of ribosomal RNA, that's R RNA, and proteins. The tRNA interact with the mRNA at three binding sites. You're going to have your A site, your P site, and your E site. Right? And those are going to go in order, A, P, and then E. A is going to be the amino acylation site. That's where you're going to combine the tRNA and the amino acid together. Right? Where the tRNA is adding the amino acid. Okay. 
The tRNA carrying the growing polypeptide chain is bound to the P site. Right, polypeptide chain, polypeptide is the P site, right? That's the second site. And then the E site is where it exits. That's where the tRNA exits. So translation also goes through the three different stages. Let's talk about initiation. So the components assemble on the start codon of the mRNA. In eukaryotes, each step is aided by initiation factors. Right? Initiation factor um, starts with methionine. Right? Methionine always starts the codons. Always starts the polypeptide chain. We have initiation Methionine tRNA binds directly to mRNA directed by a ribosome binding site. And then the initiator tRNA AUG pairing establishes the correct reading frame. So we have methionine UAG that tRNA, right? You have the small ribosomal subunit. It'll start and then it'll go all the way to AUG, right? And then the large subunit will come in and then bind with it right at that P site. And you can see that all on the side. It'll scan to find where the start codon is, and then it'll find that initiation complex. Then we have the translation elongation. This is where everything starts to happen. Assemble complex reads the string of codons in the mRNA one at a time while joining spe specified amino acids into the polypeptide. Okay. This is facilitated by an elongation factor. So once again, we have another protein that facilitates this whole process. All right. The peptide bond forms between the C-terminal end of the, grow, of the growing polypeptide chain on the P site and the amino acid on the A site of the tRNA catalyzed by, the, by peptidyl transferase. Yet another protein that is going through this process. Ribosome translocates to the next codon, and the empty tRNA re is released from the E site, right? That's the exit site, and the ribosome is ready to begin the next round of the elongation cycle. Right? So it comes into the A site, goes to the P site, right? Gets elongated, and then exits through the E site. Then we have termination. The complex disassembles after the last amino acid by the mRNA once it's been added to the polypeptide. Termination takes place when the A site arrives at one of the stop codons. Okay. The stop codon is read by a protein release factor. So the stop codon has what's called a release factor on it. That's what the little yellow thing is. So the stop codon doesn't have a 
specific T RNA on it. It has a release proton, protein on it, release factor or termination factor on it. Okay. Termination is similar in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. All right. So this isn't just happening once on every strand of RNA, mRNA. This is actually happening a lot on every strand of mRNA. So there's what's called polysomes. So once the first ribosome has begun translation, you're going to see a lot of other ones doing the exact same thing on one strand. Ribosomes continue to attach as translation continues and become a space among the mRNA like beads on a string, forming a polysome. In prokaryotes, transcription and translation are typically coupled, and polysome forms while mRNA is being made. So you're going to find like two going at the same time. So all of this is going on inside every cell of your body just to keep up with everything that's going on. So after your proteins are made, they're gonna to need to be processed. Many proteins require helper proteins, other proteins that help them out with what they need to do. Chaperones or chaperonins to fold them into their final 3D shapes. So sometimes they need to be folded into like specific shapes in order to do their function. So they need other proteins to help them fold. Finished proteins are sorted within the cell into three, three different compartments. Um, the cytosol synthesized on free ribosomes, right? So if they need to go to a um, cytoskeleton, they will be taken to the cytoskeleton or microtubules or other parts like the vacuole. The endomembrane system, including the ER, the Golgi body, the vesicles, lysosomes, other things like that. So proteins fold into their fibril form are usually tagged to be taken to other places. So if they're tagged, they'll usually find a motor protein. So if they're tagged, they'll usually find a motor protein or something to take them into that place. So membrane-bound organelles, um, other than the membrane endomembrane system, including mitochondria, chloroplasts, microbodies, other things like that, will usually go through post-translational import. Um, these are organelle-specific transport complexes. Um, so they will have a specific type of translational um, arrangement that they'll need to be designed to do. Also, there's some proteins that will have specific segments that will need to be removed in order to get, um, get to be active again, right? So they'll have an inactive form and then they'll have an active form. Um, sometimes these are specifically for specific times or specific parts of the cell. Okay. 
So now we're gonna be talking about um, mutations. So we talk about different types of mutations. There's spontaneous mutations. Um, all types of base pair mutations can occur spontaneously. These spontaneous mutations occur naturally within the cell. But when an organism is exposed either deliberately or accidentally, um, these are mutagens, and DNA mutations can be induced. These are induced mutations, right? And then mutagenesis is the direct production of mutations in a laboratory for a research purpose. So there's two types of genetic mutations uh, that can alter the protein structure. These are mutations of a base pair. So if you have a specific base pair in your DNA that may have changed uh, depending on the normality of what the protein is, then it can change the protein either dramatically or not. Or the movement of transposable elements. So if you have a normal element that has has just have one location in your gene, but has been moved, that can really affect how your protein has, you know, is going to function. Okay, first let's talk about uh, base pairs. So, in your base pairs, you know, we have the three codons, right? We're gonna have one, we're, we, we have the three that measure one codon, right? Well, there's four base pair substitution mutation types. Um, three that just have base pairs and four that is uh, frame shift. So one is silent where it doesn't change the amino acid at all. Um, right, it's gonna just remain the same amino acid no matter what, right? One is going to basically tell it to stop, right? It's going to basically say, if this amino acid changes, it's going to stop all of what's happening here. And then what's called missense. So one's called conservative missense, where you're going to have um, a change in Not really a change in the type of amino acid, um, but it's going to change the... It's, it's not going to change the type of amino acid, but it's going to change the amino acid. So if it's a uh, negative, negatively charged amino acid, and it changes it to another negatively charged amino acid, but it changes the actual amino acid, then it's called a conservative missense amino acid. But if it's a non-conservative amino acid, like if it changes it from a negatively charged amino acid to a positively charged amino acid, that's non-conservative missense amino acid. And that can change it completely. So those are the point mutations. And it's called point mutations because it changes a single point in the sense of the, uh, the DNA level. 
Okay. And then we have what's called frame shift mutations. And this is really, this is kind of really bad. So what can happen is you have a set of DNA and you have one, um, one nucleotide either coming in or going out of the nucleotide sequence. And that will cause all the nucleotides in front of it to either shift down or shift forward. Now think of that, all three of those codon pairs will change depending on what happens in front or below that frame shift mutation. That can change that frequency wildly. So that's a really, really awkward mutation to come across. So then we have transposable elements. Right? All organisms contain segments of DNA called transposable elements that can move from one place to another within a genome, within a cell's genome, right? We can move one part of a genome to another part, right? This is those exons. Transpositions involves a type of genetic recombination which the target site is not homologous with the transposable element. So it can occur in two ways, just like, you know, any type of document, you can copy and paste it or cut and paste it, right? So in eukaryotes, DNA transposons, right, transposable elements that transpose DNA intermediate are called DNA transposons. In most cases, this is non-replicative, right, cut and paste. The enzyme transposase catalyzes the reactions inserting and removing the transposable elements from DNA. So it basically just takes it out and then pastes it somewhere else. Most DNA transposons have inverted repeat sequences. So at the end, what they have is called inverted repeat sequences. So you're going to have a C A C E E E E A C A C U A C A C T T T T and then at the other end you see T T T T A C A C A C A C right so you'll just have inverted repeat sequences at the end of each one of those. I don't know if that made any sense, but Inverted repeat sequences at the end of each. Those are transposons. So that you know where each of those are. Now, there are things called retro transposons in eukaryotics. These can be copy and pasted. but they have to go through intermediate RNAs. And there's some problems with that. It, it goes through RNA and you have to synthesize a second DNA strand. Um, yeah. 
Anyway. And then there's bacterial transposable elements. These contain only the gene for transposase. The uh, insertion sequences contains only the genes for transposase, which catalyzes reactions inserting or removing the transpose transposable elements from the DNA. So these at two ends, they're short inverted repeated sequences. They enable transposase to identify where the ends of the transposable elements are. So the transposome has inverted repeated sequences at each end, right? Enclosing a central region with one or more genes. The inverted repeating sequences may include the inserted sequences that provides transposase. Nope. Those without the inserted sequences ends have short short inverted repeated sequences and transposase gene in the central region. Additional genes in the central region typically are for antibiotic resistance. So right at the top here we can see the inverted repeated sequences and the TE transposition. Right, that's the IS element. Right, and then right below that, we can see each IS element surrounding the whole transposon. And that central region can have antibiotic resistance, that antibiotic resistance gene in it. So another fascinating study that many scientists have been working on. Since 2003, the National Human Genome Research Institute has been studying all about the human genome. Human genome. In 2013, ENCODE, ENCODE reported the most complete information about the human transcriptome to date. This transcriptome mix study revealed pervasive transcription of the genome and variable expression of gene isoforms, protein coding genes that are transcribed into different forms of mRNA. So basically, we actually do have the full human genome right now. Um, that being said, we don't have like yours or mine or anything. We just have the full human genome. Um, for attendance, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to fill out a sentence or two telling me why this is important. Why, why is this research important to, to humans, to, to you, to us, to anybody? Why is trying to figure out the human genome important? Um, other than that, make sure you do lab, and I will see you later.